Thank you for joining us this morning, and I also want to say a big welcome to the folks that are watching us live on Facebook right now. Uh, it is my honor to be serving as the uh, moderator for this session. Uh, we'll be discussing safety, the road to zero. Uh, before we get started, I do want to, and before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to start off with the slide that I typically talk about uh, at every conference I go to. Uh, let's see if we, there we go. So there's four numbers up here that I want to share with you as part of our discussion this morning. The first number you see up there, 3,591. You might have heard James Bass talk about this yesterday morning. Uh, that is the number of fatalities we had last year on Texas roadways in Texas. The 153, that represents the number of fatalities we had in our work zones in Texas last year. November 7, 2000, that was the last deathless day on Texas roads. I want you all to think about that. That's been over 19 years since we've had a deathless day on our roads in Texas. The last number you see, 67,856. That represents how many lives we have lost since November 7th of 2000. This is why this panel is here. This is why it's very important to all of us. And I'm extremely proud to be on stage with all three panelists. Uh, let me start with the introductions really quick. Our first to my left is Commissioner Laura Ryan. She serves on the TxDOT Transportation Commission. Next to her is uh, Chief Hank Sibley with the Department of Public Safety. And then uh, next to Chief Sibley is Maggie Gunnels with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So please give a warm welcome to all three of them. <clears throat> so we're gonna begin with get, letting them each have an opportunity to give some opening comments. Uh, the main thing I'm looking for also on top of their opening comments is what is your motivation around traffic safety? Um, what's, what's driving you to push this message to make a difference and end the streak, especially all those numbers that we just talked about, which are, I don't like to call them numbers. I, that, those are families, those are loved ones. And um, I don't like to call them stats. I like to call those human beings that we lost. So what is your motivation behind this? Commissioner um, Ryan, I'll, I'll start I'll with you. Start. Um, I can sum it up in two words, and it's commitment and accountability. Um, what motivates me or the motivation behind uh, what, what I do, what we do, is when I accepted the position on the commission, you take an oath to serve the citizens of Texas. Um, I truly can't think of a better way to serve than to make sure that everybody gets home safely when they commute on the, on the roads we build. Um, so to me, that's, that's commitment. Um, accountability. Um, as you saw, November 7th, 2000 was the last deathless day that we had uh, on Texas roads. Um, that's 19 years, 735, 7,035 days. I don't want to see the 20th anniversary. And, you know, when you think about that, 90% of the deaths, the 67,000 mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters that have died, 90% of those lost lives were preventable. So multiply that times an average of 10 a day for six, you know, 7,000 days. Um, we need to stop that. And that's a, a commitment to personal accountability that we make an effort to do something about that. So that's what motivates me. The other part of what motivates me is um, if you think about, too, that time frame and put it into context, November 7th, 2000 was an election day. We were voting, the, the, the country was voting for our next president on the last day we didn't have a fatality on Texas roads. And the candidates were George W. Bush and Al Gore. So think about that time frame. I think most of us were around um, and thinking about who we might vote for. Think about all that's happened in your life since then and think about on average 10 people have not made it home at the end of every day. So that's what motivates me. Um, if you, if, if you, you know, I took those things to heart, and now um, I'm motivated to, to try to bring everyone home safely. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Right. Chief Sibley? 
Well, good morning. Um, my motivation basically has to do with public safety, obviously the Department of Public Safety. I've got to admit, when I started my law enforcement career in Louisiana nearly 40 years ago, I really just wanted to have a car with red lights and gun and be able to drive fast. Um, <laughs> as I got older and more mature, and then when I came to work for Texas DPS, um, became a father and really had some experience seeing the horrific tragedies that occur every day on our highways, my motivation was to try to stop it. In 1985, when I came to work for the department, I think our death rate was like 2.47 fatalities for every 100 million miles. In 2018, it was down to 1.13. That's a substantial increase based largely on the changes that have occurred in engineering, vehicle safety, some of the laws to protect people, um, and education. We have worked together to educate the public and to become smarter out there, but there's still a lot to do. So in the 35 years I've been with DPS, I've seen that much change. You know, in the rest of my career, I want to see even more change. As Dr. Ryan said, deathless days, why should it be 19, almost 20 years to have a deathless day? We're in a position now where we need to have a lot of deathless days. Most of our crashes are preventable, and the state troopers of Texas are out there every day, as well as other law enforcement agencies. We're not just enforcing the law, but our enforcement hopefully deters violations and hopefully gets people to actually think about what they're doing. It's an educational process. So my motivation is to try to make Texas as safe as possible, and our Texas state troopers that are in the field every day are doing the same. Thank you. Maggie. <clears throat> Well, I um, have been working away from Texas for quite a while, but I was born just about a mile from here, so a long time ago. And I started many years ago as an emergency nurse at Parkland Hospital. And so that really is where my alarm began because so much of who we saw and of who we all see um, who are involved in crashes could be prevented. And I've been thinking about that for 30 years. That dates me a little bit. Um, and I wanted to be here. I'm so delighted to be a part of the conversation. But I wanted to offer you all a couple of questions to think about. And they're questions that have been really, uh, I've been trying to answer for a long time. And so I'm just going to show you those questions. That's who we are. And I, you know, it's funny because, um, some of you might not know who we are, but we are the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, and I wanted to mention that our group in Texas works closely with the other states around here. And I did want to make sure I complimented you all on all the great work you do because everyone looks to Texas for ideas and solutions. But to the questions, this slide that you'll see is not about the numbers because, and frankly, if it were, it's. That these aren't numbers, these are people and families and mothers and daughters. But just look at this slide for a second. And as you look at this, I would tell you that we've tried every which way over the years to try to, to get people motivated about this issue. And so I've thought about the crash clock and all of these different <coughs> slides that we use. And I'm, you know, I wonder, you know, these things just don't motivate people. I mean, we try different ways to present the data because it's personal. Um, so I was thinking about that slide, and as we talk today, when I think about motivation back to days when I used to see people dying and frankly suffering terrible injuries from crashes, um, I've started to think about crashes in this way. And, you know, yesterday it was interesting because I heard um, one of our colleagues talk about 10 people dying on Texas roads a day, and my question is, like, why aren't people standing up and shouting about that? Um, it's alarming to me, thinking that before we all leave today, people are going to die out on the roads. So I just offer this as, as I've been trying to reframe how I think and how we motivate others. And so I really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is a public health problem, and I think it's a serious problem. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And, and you know, one thing I heard from all three of you is that this is very personal. Um, and, and, and I feel the same way. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask this question, uh, question to the audience really quick because, uh, you know, just hearing that from all of you, I'm curious in the audience, 
um, by show of hands, how many of you have lost a loved one, whether it be a family member, friend, coworker, um, due to a crash in Texas? Raise your hands, please. I want to raise them really high, please, because I know I've, I'm one of those. So look around that room. This is why we are here. This is why we have to make a difference. Um, and that's why I'm very pleased to be, again, up here with these folks, because this is a mission that we have to get the message out to the people to change the culture across this state. So with that, I'd like to start off with uh, asking some questions. I'd like to start off with Commissioner Ryan, if that's okay. Um, first off, I want to say, you know, thanks to your leadership. Um, last year, the Transportation Commission um, passed a minute order um, adopting Road to Zero. Uh, with the goal to getting zero fatalities by the year 2050. Um, what's behind this, and how did you become a, b a believer that this could happen? Um, I'll start with what's behind it. Um, that's the easy one, I think. Um, it, um, you know, safety is at the heart of everything that TxDOT does. So what's behind it is something that's been there for a very, very long time, I think was probably just a little quieter than it needed to be. Um, I think I can safely speak for the commission, my, my peers, uh, TxDOT leadership and the 12,000 employees of TxDOT, we care. We do what we do because we care. So that minute order and the approval the, when everybody voted on it, I don't think that was a tough decision. I don't think it was tough to make the decision to, to make that. The commitment of the road to zero and zero fatalities by 2050 um, is, a, is a big hill to climb. But I think because we care, we're more than willing to take it on. And we're interested in cutting those number, the number of fatalities by 2035. So it is a process. But I'll also go back to the way to get to that 2050 goal is we're looking for one day. We just want to start with one day that we have zero fatalities on our roads. We average 10. We've done some data and some research, and the lowest number we can find is two. Two deaths, that's the lowest number we can find. So really, um, you cannot accomplish anything without a vision. You cannot accomplish anything without a strategy, and we set that. So that's what uh, the road to zero is and the, the 2050 goal, zero fatalities. But we want to start with one day. We're just looking for one <laughs> to start. Um, how did I become a believer? You know, it was, um, it was a journey. We were talking about this a little bit backstage, that, um, and, and the compliment goes to everyone here, but um, it was shared that Texas is a leader in this. A lot of states won't talk about it. A lot of states don't take this on. And, you know, I looked and, and my response was, you know, I can't say we were always like that, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my personal perspective is that I joined the commission a year and a half ago, or three and a half years ago, time flies, um, and was with DMV for six years before that. And I don't know that I really internalized what, what this meant. 10 fatalities a day, and, and, and I am at fault for that. Over time of hearing the stories, and every November, the commission was handed a sign in the street. We were asked to have our picture taken. Um, we supported the campaign, but I can't say I truly got it. Um, because when you hear about, you know, it's been 17 years, 18 years, 19 years, you, you think, well, how can this be? This is horrible. But I also kind of thought, well, what can I do about it? And I think that's what's gotten us here, because we all kind of pass the buck and say, well, I can't fix this. So there was a point of hearing enough about this and hearing the stories and looking into the eyes of the families that were still devastated. It finally hit me that I can do something about it, because it, it really is about me. Um, you know, we heard one of the legislators yesterday say that there's probably not an appetite for more legislation. Um, we, we, we passed the no texting bill. What was interesting to me on that is that my initial response was, mm, that's, that's not good. But the more I thought about it, I think that is a good thing. Because if, some, if they had said they were going to take this on, I think many people in our society would go, not my problem. 
I don't have to do anything, they're gonna handle it. And the reality is that we have to handle this. This is a societal issue, it's an invisible epidemic, and the only way to fix it is the way we got there, and that's us. So I personally became accountable. Um, and when I made that commitment, I started talking about it and, and making it real. And I am appreciative of my fellow commissioners who indulged me every month in listening to me figure out how many, at 67 lives, if an average person is six feet, how, much, how long a line of coffins would be. How many planes were filled with that number? And we continued to talk about it and make it real, and it became important to us, more important, and we're willing to talk about it. Um, some of that ownership and making that real, um, the reality became ownership. And I want to share some of that reality that helped get me here. So I've got two slides I'd like to share with you um, that helped with this journey. The first one that you're going to see is, um, they're coming. It's up there. Oh, it's up there. I can't see here. Sorry. Um, OK, we're going to go backwards. Yes, this one. Um, the first one you're going to see was this past November. And this picture is uh, Houston City Hall. And on November 7th, which was the anniversary, 19-year anniversary, a flag was placed uh, around the pond for a, every life that was lost. Every one of those flags represents a family member. It represents a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, grandparents. Um, and it was an amazing sight because it really started to impact what we were trying to change. And the goal is to have no flags. We want no flags there. But that day when you can actually visualize it, um, it made a difference. But last year, 3,647 lives were lost right. on our roads. 90% of those were preventable. So again, this is real, this is reality. The next slide, um, is an amazing family, uh, honestly. This is a white family. Um, they had the courage uh, to come speak before the commission in November. And this is about as real as it gets. Um, Allie, that's her mom, and Allie on her shoulders uh, would have turned three in December. And she was killed last so September in a parking lot on a Sunday, sunny Sunday afternoon. Um, parking lot of a park and soccer fields. She was killed by a driver who was on their cell phone. Did not know that they hit Allie and was still on their cell phone when they got out of the car and was told what had just happened. So when we talk about distracted driving and we talk about real, this little girl um, is, is gone her brothers and sisters miss her terribly. Her parents miss her terribly. And the cause was because somebody's call couldn't wait. Um, and they're, they're, that family's lives are destroyed too. But think about it, it was a soccer field on a Sunday afternoon. That driver's children were there also. So they're a parent. So this makes it reality. This, this is what motivates me. I think there's one more picture of Allie, or maybe not, but um, yeah. that's her. The cell phone. Um, somebody's conversation couldn't wait. So um, I, if, if this doesn't motivate you, if this doesn't make you a believer, um, I don't know what is, and that's what we're here today to talk about is how do we, how do we change this and keep all these individuals alive? because Allie's not going to be here anymore. Although three times a year, her parents have asked that um, they call what they call the pink nail week. Um, it's, and they're asking drivers to paint their nails uh, bright pink, which is Allie's favorite color. And um, it is in April, which is Distracted Driving Month, uh, September, which is her anniversary of her death, and December, which, uh, December 8th, which would have been her birthday. So again, that's, it's these kinds of events and stories that I am exposed to that motivate me and make, that make me a believer that we need to do this. 
It's not just that we can, we need to do this. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you're right, it comes down to ownership and accountability. And, and, and that's what it boils down to. And you mentioned about the 90% of human error is the cause of a lot of these uh, crashes that occur, these fatal crashes. And that was a prime example. And so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chief Sibley, <coughs> got a question for you. With all these crashes that your law enforcement have to investigate, do you all ever get numb to you know, investigating all these crashes and, and trying to find out what's going on and what, and what motivates you to keep being out there to, to keep the public safe with everything that you see and all your law enforcement officers on the roads? Well, truthfully, I sometimes wish you could get numb to it. In my 40 years and 35 years with Texas Department of Public Safety, I've seen horrific things. I've seen children that are dead for no reason. It's like the commissioner was saying, somebody texting. I've made the notifications of families. I've told the mother their daughter's not coming home. And I've told the kids and the husband their wife's, wife and mother's not coming home. Every one of them sticks with me to this day. I really, if I think about it, you know, it, it's almost like you can't get it out of your mind. The motivation is, is what you feel, the pain. We're all humans in law enforcement, EMS, public safety workers, highway workers. We're all, the things we see are imprinted on us. Many of y'all have never seen anything like that. We see it on a routine basis. And it takes a toll. But it makes you ask why. Why does it have to happen? Why do people have to die for basically stupid reasons? A text, not paying attention, somebody drinking a beer too many, bad judgment calls, you know, and it motivates us to try to be there, to be that deterrent, to educate, take enforcement where necessary, and to try to prevent things from happening. You know, and in law enforcement, if we can be the ones they think about when they're getting ready to take that last drink in a bar, they're worried about the highway patrol or police officer getting them, because they're probably not thinking about crash, because that happens to somebody else until it doesn't. You know, if, if, if we can be that person, if we can make, look at these crashes and learn from them and find out what the common causative factors are, and if we can actually, you know, take steps, whether it's engineering issues or we need to educate kids more, different things like that. I will tell you, for example, uh, you may not know, but uh, in the wake of the Santa Fe school shooting, the governor tasked the Department of Public Safety with a school safety initiative. Last school year, Texas state troopers made over 32,000 school visits, documented school visits, where they would go in the schools and, and make contact with the kids and the staffs. But we also saw educational opportunities, chances to, because of those contacts, to get off the road and get in the schools and we become involved in these every 15 minute programs, these educational programs where we actually, you know, educate kids about it and we develop relationships. And, you know, sometimes these one-on-one -on -one relationships are what make people think, they think about these people. Most of the troopers are in small rural communities where they know most of the people there. So we, we make an impact that way. We have 278 troopers officing in schools that actually the schools have given us offices and we have troopers stationed in the schools. Not as school resource officers, that's just where they go and come to work. So we take these opportunities every time to try to save lives one by one, educate children, educate their parents one by one, that bad things do happen to good people. Good job. So I've kind of got a follow-up question to that, uh, to build on that a little bit. So what seems to be the biggest challenge in enforcing traffic laws where drunk driving and distracted driving are so pervasive. Um, and how are you all handling that? Well, you know, DWI laws have been on the books, you know, for a long time. And with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, for example, back in the 80s, there became a public surge against drunk driving. And now a lot of people use designated drivers. People actually think about that. We've seen decreases in our DWI rates. Of course, you know, we deal with distracted driving has become another, another problem as technology's improved. The cell phone, you know, I don't know, it's really hard to capture the number of distracted driving fatalities that we have because, you know, a lot of people don't report it, report what they're using or admit what they're, what they're having. I've seen a lot of crashes where I know that a cell phone was a causative factor. If you realize if you're traveling 70 miles an hour and other vehicles coming 70 miles an hour at you and that person is texting and they cross two feet of a yellow stripe on the road, it's a bad day for everybody involved. And it happens all the time. 
I think last, in 2018, I think we had 10.9% of all the crashes that, that were investigated, these are TxDOT stats, were related to distracted driving. That's what we know about. It's hard to enforce. Is there a public will to enforce this? You know, look at the laws. I mean, every one of y'all drives, have you sat at a stoplight and looked around and see what people are doing? You know, people have their heads down. You see it all the time. They're not paying attention. Uh, pedestrians, you know, I've, I've lived in downtown Houston, and look at the street corners. Everybody's just waiting, looking down at their cell phones, and they step off the curb. What are our pedestrian fatality and injury rates as a result of something like that? Again, distraction, people not paying attention. Our lives have gotten so busy. Technology has gotten so, so high tech. There are so many distractions available. People are doing everything but drive. And it's probably the most dangerous thing they do on a daily basis. So the difficulties are sometimes the lack of public will. Again, that attitude of it's not going to happen to me. You know, and, and people not, and, and then they call it an accident. We don't call them accidents anymore. We call them crashes. Yeah. Accidents don't have a, you know, an accident's an accident. It just happens. Crashes happen for a reason. And most of the reasons are going to be driver error. And so it's really difficult to enforce when you don't have the, the people who want to back it up with the public will. We educate and do some enforcement, but at the end of the day, um, it, it's a very difficult task, but we try to do our best. Can I add to that? Sure. Um, two, <clears throat> a great point, and, and it reminded me of two things. One, um, you know, to your point of DWI and distracted driving, I have stats from 2017, but in 2017 with the grants that TxDOT was able to do, there were 5,400 DWI arrests, there were 21,000 distracted driving citations, 54 citations of people not wearing their seatbelt, and 290,000 speeding citations. So the complacency comment is, these are all things that laws are on the books. People know they shouldn't be doing it. And these are just the citations with the grant, so I know there's a lot more. Um, I met with, um, and this was a great comment by uh, DPS and the Sheriff's Department a couple of weeks ago because TxDOT does a fatality review every month, every district to understand what we need to change. And I wanted to understand what went into those reviews and what type of communication went on and, and how do we measure what we do and how do we decide what to do. But one of the comments was we need more resources for enforcement. And the follow-up in that discussion was, but enforcement one, we shouldn't do it, right? People shouldn't do it. It's, it's against the law. You get a ticket, but the enforcement doesn't work because the follow-through farther downstream doesn't, there's no accountability there. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to probably be, I don't know, maybe unpolitically correct, but attorneys get people off. Judges decide that it's a minimum sentence, right? If we all make a mistake or we do something wrong, we don't want to be accountable. But as a society, we have made it okay. And, and the comments from DPS was that we can only do so much, but if they get off, they're actually more likely to go do it again. So as we work to, to take ownership and accountability of this, as individuals and citizens, we have to encourage our elected officials and our, and our judges and our area, you know, I guess career, our attorneys, to also take that responsibility too. Um, there are times and situations when there's probably circumstances that somebody should not get uh, a full sentence or whatever, but if, when you hear that people have had five DWIs and then they've killed somebody, there's a problem. So the problem, we have to continue to broaden um, how we look at this and who we talk to and how we feel about it and then express how we feel. Um, if you guys think that's okay, that's great. I'm not telling you how to think. I don't think it's okay, right? I think if somebody's had one DWI, um, they probably shouldn't, shouldn't get off again but, um, because people are dying because of it. So that was an aha moment for me in, in the discussion with them that it isn't just enforcement and writing the tickets, it isn't just us educating and not doing it, it isn't just the legislature um, passing different laws. As a society, we have to be willing to hold each other accountable.
Absolutely, good point. And also, I want to key on two things that you mentioned, and that is that distracted driving is underreported. And, and I think I've heard that from every law enforcement agency mm -hmm. across the state, but yet when we're driving down the roadways, always see people on their phones while they're driving, and that, that's a scary thing. The other thing I want to mention is, I'll, I'm glad you mentioned this, is that a lot of people refer to these as accidents. It, it's, it's not an accident. That means it was not preventable. In reality, the, all these crashes are preventable, and, it, and that's where these, we got to put the phones down. We got to make sure and make good choices. Don't be drinking and driving. Drive to conditions. Drive the speed limit. These are all things that we talk about all the time. And that, that's what will make a change, I, I think, in our fatalities across the state. So thank you for those comments. Thank you. So, Maggie, I've got a question for you. Um, since you come from the education side and, 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 you know, with NHTSA, are the federal and state governments like Texas doing enough to educate people? or even scare the public to exercise good, safe practice in driving? Well, that's a complicated question. Uh, and I really, I do, would be remiss if I didn't um, say kudos to TxDOT um, for really reaching so many folks, especially the governor's representative for highway safety, James Bass, who's really a safety leader and supports all these different partnerships. So, um, but can we do more? Of course. So I guess I would frame the problem a couple of ways and then I can provide a couple of examples. Um, and the, if you think about it, we, these deaths and the thousands and thousands of injuries from crashes um, span all kinds of highway safety problems. They're not just inside the car, they're outside the car. Um, and they involve older populations, younger populations, they're in urban and rural areas and so there's really not a one size fits all. If we all do this, the problem's gonna solve itself. And so I think the strategy of working with the young people starting in the schools is, is one of the really critical elements. I, I think it's, I don't think we can do enough of that because we really have to start with that generation. And I would add that I'm, I'm even concerned about our next generation of people who work in safety as well whether it's a law enforcement officer or highway safety specialist or traffic engineer. So I think education at a young age is essential. Um, but um, I think that we have to really focus in areas where it's, it's greatly needed. And I, I know we try to base everything we do on data, but we really have to make it a social norm across all the issues that it's just not okay. It's, and, and, it has to be okay to say, hey, get out of the car. Don't get in the car. Don't drive. It's, it's challenging in Texas. It's, Texas is a place for celebrations. Um, but the good news is there are a lot of alternatives. So, you know, we didn't have Uber and Lyft and, and those kinds of things when I was in high school and college. So, we, so to education, I think we absolutely need to work in our school systems. I think we need to work with every partner who's interested in safety across Texas, and that could be insurance companies we spoke about a little bit earlier um, when we were talking a bit backstage. That can be employers. Um, it, almost anyone has an element or a really skin in the game to educate people. So um, the programs now um, need to be, I think, a combination of both. Of course, there's technology. It's a digital world, as well as hands-on. It's awareness with bracelets. It's, it's everything we can do. So I'll just add that one of the really, there's two things that, um, that I think are really interesting. And one is I've seen a real um, leadership on TxDOT's part to reach out to new partners, Bucky's, as an example, for consumer education reaching out across partners, both across our education systems, systems, as well as to partners who touch a lot of people, I think is really important. Um, and so I think that's another avenue. And you all are doing some really innovative public education campaigns. You can't really be afraid that um, to offend people. I shouldn't say that because I actually, that's not on behalf of the Department of Transportation. But anyway, um, so. <laughs> Um, you've mentioned political correctness, but you have to be bold, and I think you're doing that. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. But anyway, right. yes, so there's education across the schools. It's across every safety partner we can find. Right. It's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It's everyone. Great. 
Thank you. Well, it looks like we got a question in. Um, it says that Ms. Gunnels mentioned that uh, traffic, traffic fatalities is not only a transportation problem, but it's also a public health problem. What efforts, if any, are underway by health and transportation agencies to jointly address it at federal, state, and local levels? Well, sure. Um, I, I would mention first that we, um, we, you know, we as, as everyone here does, we focus on data. And of course, I like the public health analogy because I too believe that crashes aren't accidents. I think they're a preventable problem. Um, but across agencies, we work with certainly our, our um, agencies like the Federal Highway Administration, Texas Division, and our partners at the federal level. But I will tell you, it might surprise you, I'm not sure, but it might surprise you that um, we do talk to folks at FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we actually have um, an EMS division um, at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration who works on training and education for emergency providers. And actually, frankly, I think TxDOT has some efforts in training rural uh, mm -hmm. and frontier EMS professionals on safety. So we do work across federal agencies uh, jointly. Um, clearly, it's not the same thing as an infectious disease, but where we can work together, especially on issues like emergency medical services, we absolutely do. It's EMS.gov if you haven't had a chance to take okay. a look. You'll see some of those activities there. Great, thank you. So I have a question that's anyone in the panel is welcome to uh, answer this question. How do we address complacency with the public when it comes to fatalities on our roadways? And also, to kind of add to that, what do you say to those people that think that road to zero is not achievable? Well, I, the complacency issue, you know, it, it becomes a norm. You know, people begin to think, well, people are going down the highways. That's just the way it is. You know, and to a certain degree, you know, driving is dangerous. But road to zero is achievable. I mean, obviously, if nobody drove today, you know, we wouldn't have any, any fatal crashes. So it's possible. But in the next tier, that's not going to happen, obviously. The next tier would be people to actually think about what they're doing and not getting involved, have the commitment. Dr. Gunnels was talking about education. The education piece works. I was a state trooper in Texas on the road in 1986 when the safety belt laws first went into effect. They were not popular. People felt we were infringing upon their rights. They felt that they, they'd just about fight you over a ticket. Uh, now look at today, I think Texas has about a 94% safety belt compliance rate. It's higher than the national average. That's phenomenal. That's the effect of education. That's changing the societal norm and the societal expectations. You know, people realize that other people's accidents do affect them. They affect their insurance rates, medical care rates, affect on every tier. So we need to approach everything, just like DWI driving, which has a sort of a downward trend. We're dealing with some new issues with obviously impaired driving for you know, marijuana and prescription drugs and other drugs that are challenges that we're facing on a national basis, and it's affecting us in Texas also. But uh, we just have to change the societal norms, what the expectations are. The expectations, the accountability that you be responsible for your vehicle and your behavior on the road. And as the commissioner was saying, you know, the court system is one of the accountable parts. You know, you know, you just can't chalk it off to an accident when somebody is at fault. I don't want to hear it's an accident if that person crossed the center line doing whatever and killed or injured somebody that I dearly love. I believe we all need to be held responsible. We need to be responsible. We need to take it seriously and change the societal norms, societal expectations of, of what's expected every time we get behind a wheel of a vehicle. Can I, <clears throat> to the... Um the celebration of seatbelts, um, and I am pleased. I understand that when the seatbelt law went into effect, about 70 percent, at least from what I read, um, people wore their seatbelt, and it's about 94 now. Last year, we still had 916 people that lost their lives because of not wearing a seatbelt. Correct. So think about that. We, I mean, it, it's a law. There's a success. It's improved, but still, almost a thousand people just last year alone died in a crash on our roads because they didn't have a seatbelt on. Why? You don't drive differently with or without it. Most of us don't dance around a car, we sit still. So why are we not at 
Why did those 900 people still have to die? So um, I'm not willing to take that as a, as, a, as a victory yet, because that is one that there is no reason to not be at 100%. There's just no reason. Um, so th that, I think, is part of the complacency standpoint. And I think that we have to celebrate our wins, but um, accept the brutal facts of our current reality. And that's that we are still not doing what we need to do to make sure everybody gets home safe. And, and we need to understand why. So I think that that, from a complacency standpoint, is, in, is important. I think we are numb as a society. And I think we've become OK with that. I think we're afraid to, I asked somebody once, you know, don't mess with Texas is great. For a while, we had a littering problem. You wouldn't be caught dead throwing something out the window now. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't throw something out the window with your kids in the car, trash wise. But as parents, we pick up the phone and we text with our kids in the, in the car or our nieces or, or nephews, or they see people texting and we don't say anything. So we have to make this a, um, politically, we either have to make, you know, get rid of the political correctness and get in other people's business and let people get into our business, or we have to um, make it socially unacceptable. We've heard a lot about the coronavirus. How many people have died on the, in, in, nationally in the coronavirus? And I'm not making light of it. Please, every death or life loss is important. But we hear more about that than we do what's going on in our own state and what's being done about it, because we've accepted it. Um, I don't think it's impossible. You, I think the other part of your question was, some people say it's impossible, and that makes me angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just does. And it should make everybody angry. You know, what the definition of impossible is means our minds just can't comprehend it, which as a society is a sad place to be. You know, I think about Thomas Edison, who created, invented the light bulb, people, thought that was impossible. And, and why? Because having light was only possible with fire. That's all anybody knew. It's sad that it is said that it's impossible because all we know is that people die when you get on the roads in a car. And we're okay with that. We can't comprehend a life without death when people die. That's why people say it's impossible. That is a sad place for us to be as a society, and, and, and we should, everybody should be angry at that. It is possible, um, and we will get there. Um, but we won't get there until everybody decides they are part of the solution, everybody. And that also means the next time you are in a car and somebody's on their cell phone, ask them to pull over and get out. Because how many of you would, not, would, would do that if somebody was w drinking and driving or high and driving? Would you get in the car with them? Would you put your kids in the car with them? But often we put our kids in the car for carpooling with parents that, that are on their phone and we never ask. Do you text and drive? Do you pick up your phone and, and, and take a call or do things that aren't hands-free? And we more than willing to put our kids in the car with them. So, it has to be, it's a mindset change. But I think that the fact that people say it's impossible just means that we've accepted something that, that we, and that we've comprehended that it's okay. I agree with you on that. And I, and I know that when I have, a, when I talk to friends and family about this and they say, well, that's, that's not achievable. And I say, well, what would you say for your family? Mm -hmm. What's that goal for your family? And they all say the same thing, zero. And I think everyone in this audience would say the same thing about their family and their loved ones. And so. By saying that, I think it is achievable. Uh, we have to work on it, obviously, and I think you bring up some good points. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it looks like we got another question from the audience. Um, it says 91% of deaths are preventable and distracted driving deaths are skyrocketing. Have we, reach, have we reached the point where we use technology to disable cell phones while driving along with wider mandated use of vehicle interlocks to prevent repeat DUIs? Get that one. Well, the technology's there. I mean, obviously, cell phones could be disabled whenever a vehicle's moving, but is a public will there to do it? I mean, it's such a convenience. It's become just such part of our life. And until the public will, via the legislatures, mandates that these companies do this, that's not going to be there. You know, to the point the doctor mentioned that texting and driving, distracted driving from a cell phone, is the equivalent of drunk driving. 
I think statistics bear it out. You know, you let your child leave the house with a cell phone in hand, you wouldn't let them leave with six pack of beer, you know, that type deal. So again, it's socially acceptable, but if the public will ever decides to do that, um, you know, when the legislature ever decides to, to mandate that, that is something that's doable. I just don't think that uh, from the cell phone perspective, the technology perspective, that we're there yet. Um, you know, with the technology we are, but as far as the will. As far as the interlock devices, you know, the courts can mandate that. Again, that's, a, that's an accountability on the courts aspect because that technology is there now to avoid the repeat offenders. There are ways to get around everything, but that would sure make it difficult for the majority of people that intended to drive drunk a second time to it. Yeah, you know, real quick, I've, I've heard, well, manufacturers of vehicles should put the technology in the cars that disable the cell phones. Um, again, often our solutions are things that somebody else can do that we can't do. Our cell phones now, every Apple phone, I, I can't speak to the other ones, because um, I don't know, but every Apple phone has a setting that you can set it to where it'll send a do not disturb message when the phone is in motion, when the vehicle's in motion. Mm -hmm. How many people knew that? I think we all know that, right? Okay, how many people have it set to do that? Okay, so there's less hands to that one than the first one. So again, it goes back to personal accountability and choices we all individually make. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I'll just mention, we did talk about um, disincentives as well in terms of incentives versus disincentives, but um, employers can tell employees you can't do it, make them sign a policy or an agreement saying you can't do that while you're at work. And most everybody works <laughs> somewhere. Right. So that's, and I know that we have those role models and, you know, certainly at TxDOT and in other agencies where they've taken that approach as well. Um, so it's not okay. Absolutely, good point. So we have another question from the audience. This one is asking, are there specific strategies targeted to address issues in urban versus rural areas or long stretches of highway associated with long distance driving? I'll just mention that I am really um, an admirer of TxDOT's partnership with Texas AgriLife um, through Texas A&M University and taking the highway safety specialists and engineers who cross the counties of Texas and having them work in rural counties um, doing highway safety. We had met with them last month and I think that's a great approach. And I'll just add that I think we have to really think hard about who we're talking to in rural communities and it might surprise you all to know that last month we met with the Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association which might seem unusual, but the reason we held a meeting with them and had them come talk to us was that they reach the rural community and they do it through social media, they do it through direct engagement. And we thought, you know, what are they doing to reach their constituents? And it's an organization that's been around for, you know, hundreds of years, so well, at least 150 or more. Um, and so I think we have op those opportunities. We have some great programs we need to capitalize on, mm -hmm. but I think we need to look at who's in the rural areas and how we can better reach them. I, yes. and I could echo on that. The long distance driving, fatigue driving, that's gonna be a factor, whether it's commercial vehicles or people traveling. And in my career, I've seen the, what TxDOT has done in the federal, on the federal systems and other agencies, uh, the rumble strips on the sides. No telling how many lives that people either not paying attention through distracted driver or falling asleep that's saved. We put center median walls and the cable barriers to keep vehicles from falling asleep, crossing the median, having head-on collision. And we've increased and improved, greatly improved in Texas, the safety areas, the rest areas that you see up on the highway. I just rode by one on Interstate 35 last night, you know, coming from Dallas. And uh, those things that, we, that we've done, we can do. Vehicle technology is there. Some cars will wake you up when, when you're doing things, and that, that's the future of it. But again, it's an awareness thing, and make it, you gotta educate people on the risk and what's happening, and get people to, again, take responsibility for themselves and stop and get out or do whatever. And again, it's, it's the education piece. I think, too, to, to segue, um, that's a great, we're working on that with the safety task force that, um, Chairman Bug 
requested that we put together and that I, I work with the team. The makeup of that task force, and, the, and it was created really to start with um, disbursement of the $600 million that the commission uh, put in place several months ago. And the intent of that money was to make sure that we, through, through data and information, found projects that had the highest impact for the lowest cost, meaning we wanted the highest level of return. We wanted to find what we could do quickly and what we could do to, to impact a lot of different areas. But when we did this project, how many lives were we going to save? And we wanted to start with projects that were going to save the most lives. And the task force is made up of a very diverse group um, of operators, engineers, leadership, uh, districts, districts from all over the state. So we have rural and we have urban. And coming together, they are collaborating to come up with the strategies and define the projects. Um, we have uh, to date, and a lot of those projects to that point are rumble strips, median barriers, mm -hmm. clearing right away so that if somebody does leave a lane departure, someone leaves the road, they have more room and ability to recover. Um, intersections lighting, signage, those types of things are the things that the task force is focusing on. And those projects that are coming in, uh, 90 of them, mm -hmm. 90, 122 came in and 90 projects were approved. So part of the money for the, the 300,000 is already actively at work. But the majority of those types of projects were rumble strips, medium barriers, clearing right away, intersection lighting, the technology behind signs, um, we heard earlier that people pay attention to flashing lights. You can put flashing lights on chevrons around curves. You can put them on stop signs, behind stop lights, on stop signs to get people's attention to make them aware that their driving behavior needs to change for the safety of them and everyone around them. So I think the strategy is being developed, um, and we are putting it to work also. Absolutely, and that's a great point. And to both of you, you know, talking about the rumble strips and the median barriers, that's something that with the safety task force, they were looking at trying to fill the gaps in, in areas across the state where we didn't have them at the point. And so, uh, though, like Commissioner Ryan said, we're looking to find ways to save lives, but also we're trying to be proactive and, and fill those gaps so we can prevent those fatalities from occurring in the future. Um, this is a question that kind of ties into all three of you, and um, it's open to anyone, but we know we talk about the three E's, engineering, education, and enforcement. And um, can you speak briefly to the importance of our collective efforts and opportunities to partner? I think that um, that's actively what we're doing. I mean, the, the collective efforts, it, it's very clear that it's going to take everyone. Um, we are partnering with uh, organizations and we're very pleased that employers have become engaged. We have um, personally met with DPS and DMV and have the commitment of the agencies there with their leadership and staff to continue to educate. Um, we have reached out, I've personally signed letters, uh, over a hundred that have gone out to universities, school ISDs, statewide ISDs, uh, major employers to share kind of the information on what I do call an invisible epidemic and what they can do and ask them for their engagement. So I think that it's being done. I think there's more that can be done and I would encourage everyone in this audience that's watching, um, reach out to whatever your circle of influence is and ask them to get involved also. And that partnership starts uh, and will spread way beyond textile. Absolutely. I can add, um in the last few years, the collaborative efforts between TxDOT, Texas DPS, other law enforcement have expanded. I know I've, I've experienced it myself. We are part of these, these task forces uh, from the law enforcement, looking at it from different perspectives, different eyes. Instead of just an engineering eye, we look at it from an enforcement eye. We look at it from an education eye. And that's the way to do it, to get everybody involved. We reach out to corporate partners, uh, trucking companies, Walmart, companies like that, and we participate in their safety rodeos and try to get them being involved in the safety aspect from their perspective because of our commercial vehicle uh, crash program, which is one that Texas pretty much is one of the leaders in the nation on. Of course, we have a lot of commercial vehicle traffic. But the partnerships are what make us successful. It's that community involvement that filters down through the educational systems as well as the governmental entities and the volunteer groups that are involved and the corporate groups. And that's the only way we're going to be successful 
is to expand it broader than us. Because we can sit up here from a text dot and federal highway perspective and, and talk about this, but if we don't have rooms like this and people to go plant the seed all over to get this started, you know, we won't be successful. And uh, successful is no fatality at the end of the day. And it is possible, you know, but it's going to take a lot of work. But even if we're not successful, everyone we reduce is a life saved. That's a, that's a victory. So we just need to work, you know, one person at a time, one life at a time to achieve our goal and never give up because it is possible. Absolutely. And I'll just echo and appreciate everything you all say. And I'll just uh, close by saying, um, and let's not forget that next generation of safety professionals and, that we, and, and passionate safety advocates that we want to bring into this discussion. Absolutely. So let's continue to do that. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan, would you like to make a closing statement? We're almost out of time here. I'd like to give you an opportunity. Um, probably more of a challenge than a statement. I, you know, in November we had uh, the press release and a lot of awareness on end the streak and what it, what it meant. And there was a, and, and truly it's a grassroots type initiative. And we had tremendous um, engagement on social media and people were involved. You saw some of the pictures just a little bit, but they shared why it was important to them. Um, and I, I don't have all the stats, but it was incredibly impressive and we can get them out. But, but the level of engagement that we saw in just the month of November was significantly more than what we had seen all of last year. And I'd like to do that again. So my challenge is, there's probably five, 700 people here. If everybody thought about, and I'm just gonna ask for two, two people that would impact if you didn't make it home, and post their picture, and tell them their why you are committed to keep your phone down, to buckle up, to do the speed limit, to get an Uber or a designated driver and not drive. And it doesn't even have to be drunk, just under the influence. It can be medication, it can be you're tired, right? But dr don't drive unless you are capable of giving it your best. And post that with the hashtag end the streak and the two people that you post their pictures, if they're old enough and have a phone, challenge them to do the same with two people. And let's see if we can get this re-engaged and get the level of awareness that we had in November again in February. And we will continue to do this because this is how we're going to make a difference. So it's a personal request and a commission challenge. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Challenge accepted. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner Ryan, and thank you, Chief Sibley. Uh, Maggie, thank you all for being here and for participating in this. I also want to thank everyone that's on Facebook that watched this live. Um, if you want more information about what we discussed today, you can go to techsot.gov. Um, for those in the audience, I ask you that you sit down for a few minutes. Uh, Facebook, thank you for joining us. I uh, appreciate you being part of this panel. Um, again, thank you to all three of you. You all did a great job today in discussing the, the efforts that we're all working on together to make a difference in this state.